not too many years ago when people were reflecting on the Christian message and how it seemed to not quite have the kind of power that it once had or how some people had been transforming it. They came up with this term moralistic therapeutic deism, MTD, meaning that for a lot of people, Christianity had become a system of ethics um, and also uh, a way to feel good about yourself and that the God who was involved in it was removed really from this world that we were pretty much to follow whatever we were learning so that we could take care of ourselves and take care of our problems. Deism, you might recall from history, is that system that believes basically that God is like a celestial uh, clockmaker. And so he'd make a clock or a watch, uh, he created everything, it set it in motion, and then left it on its own, basically saying, you know, you got everything you need, go ahead and take care of it. And for a lot of people, that kind of Christianity seems to suffice quite well. They have a system of ethics, they feel good about themselves and they know how to relate well most of the time to others. And as far as miracles and God being really involved in their lives. If God chooses to, that's fine, but they really don't expect that or really want that necessarily to happen. Then we have a gospel like today, as we are on this fifth Sunday of Lent, where Jesus highlights for us what it is that he has come to do. Once again, this is the third time in John's gospel where Jesus talks about being lifted up. And when he's talking about being lifted up, he's talking about being lifted up onto the cross. The cross was not seen by anybody in Jesus's time as being anything glorious. It's the form of Roman capital punishment that was all too familiar throughout the Roman Empire being used on those who dared to cross the empire and its decisions. And so this is what awaits Jesus, the cross. He is aware, knowing that that is to come, he is as he is in the other Gospels, concerned, worried. He's troubled, as it says in John's text here, because in his humanity, like any of us, thinking about death, especially a death that he knew awaited him, was something that did not please him any more than it would please us, the fact or the the possibilities of, of lengthy suffering, of being nailed to a cross and of hanging there, dying slowly and in an agonizing way was not something that Jesus was relishing from a human point of view. He knew that he was to be the sacrificial offering that would take away our sins and not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. That he was to be both the lamb of sacrifice as well as the priest who offered the sacrifice because he was offering up himself freely, willingly in obedience to the father. But this was not going to be an easy thing. Jesus did not go through this suffering and death in order to give us an ethical system 
that ultimately would make us feel good about ourselves and about other people. No more than he is a God who was remote, distant, uninvolved, and basically couldn't care less about his creation. So I want to share a couple of things with you. This is, was written by uh, Alexander McLaren and published in a book uh, in 20, in, reprinted in 2017. He says, the cross is the magnet of Christianity. Jesus Christ draws people, but it is by his cross mainly. Sorry, I need to change masks. This thing is just driving me crazy. Sorry, but uh, I keep slipping and I keep fogging up. So starting again, the cross is the magnet of Christianity. Jesus Christ draws people, but is by his cross mainly. Then the question arises, what is it about his death that makes it the magnet that will draw all people? People are drawn by cords of love. They may be driven by other means, but they are drawn only by love. And what is it that makes Christ's death the highest and noblest and most wonderful and transcendent manifestation of love that the world has ever seen or ever can see? The one thing that entitles people to interpret Christ's death as the supreme manifestation of love is that it was a death voluntarily undertaken for a world's sins. If you do not believe that, will you tell me what claim on your heart Christ has because he died? Has Socrates any claim on your heart? And are there not hundreds and thousands of martyrs who have just as much right to be regarded with reverence and affection as this Galilean carpenter's son has? Unless when he died, he died as the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and for yours and mine. So a universal attraction is raying out from Christ's cross and from himself to each of us. But that universal attraction can be resisted. If a person plants his feet or her feet firmly and wide apart, and holds on with both hands to do to some staple or hold fast, then the drawing cannot draw. There is the attraction, but he or she is not attracted. You demagnetize Christianity, as all history shows, if you strike out the death on the cross for a world sin. What is left then is not a magnet but a bit of scrap iron. People who want to deny the divinity of Jesus, who want to relegate him to being an ethical teacher and being a representative of this deistic God who you know, came to do this teaching, are people who obviously I never going to be drawn by the cross. It's not that the cross is attractive in and of itself. It's what it symbolizes. That's why in one sense, we're very fortunate here that we have both the altar cross that is empty, as well as that large crucifix, because it reminds us of the two parts of this Christian mystery it reminds us of Christ's dying, his willingness to take on the sins of the world for you, for me, for all people, for all time. This willingness 
to empty himself as he already did by taking on our human nature, but to empty himself even of that humanity, that life, then to trust in the Father that he would be raised up again. So it reminds us of his dying, his willingness to die, the love that he manifested by that. And then the other cross, the empty cross, reminds us that it was the means to the end, but not an end in itself, but a means that needs to be taken seriously by anybody who wants to claim the name of Christian. And that's the invitation that all of us receive, that in order for us to be truly disciples of Jesus Christ and to be truly faithful, we have to be willing, as Jesus says many times in the Gospels, to carry the cross behind him, to take up our own cross, our willingness to die for love of God, our willingness to die for love of others, our willingness to die to everything that tries to rob us of the life that God wants us to have. And here is something I would like to conclude with. It's written by a gentleman by the name of Keith Giles. And it's called, Are We Asking the Wrong Question? I recently heard Todd Hunter remark that modern American Christianity had reduced the gospel to a question that never appears in the Bible. You know the one. It goes something like this. If you knew for sure that you would die tonight, do you know that you'd be in heaven tomorrow? Hunter suggests that if we're really going to be true to the gospel of the kingdom and the philosophy of Jesus, we need instead to ask, if you knew for sure you'd be alive tomorrow, who would you follow? And how would you live your life? After all, most of us will not be dead tomorrow. We'll be alive. What we all need is a gospel for everyday life. The life we all find ourselves living is precisely where we need Jesus to rule and reign and have his way. The true gospel involves a daily process of taking up our cross and following Jesus. It is a gospel for life, not just for the day that we die. And what makes me the most upset is the idea that I've wasted so many years of my walk with Jesus focused on the wrong things. To think I've lived most of my Christian life based on the answer to the wrong question. All this time I've thought of Jesus as my Savior, but not as my Lord. And yet, if he is not one, he cannot be the other. All this time I've missed the simple truth that Jesus calls me to surrender my life to him and trade in my own empty kingdom for the eternal kingdom of God. I thought it would be fitting enough on this fifth Sunday of Lent, which begins a particular shift in the liturgy of the church towards the passion that we would think a little more, reflect a little more on what it means to follow this Jesus who is willing to be lifted up for you and me, where the crucifix, Christ crucified, stands in our life and vision. Are we willing to take the cross 
as it has been presented to us? Or are we those who just want to push Jesus to one side? We wouldn't be on the call today. We wouldn't be gathered here in church if Christ weren't important enough to us, because after all, there are other things we could be doing. But just in case we're tempted, and I can only speak for myself, that sometimes, in some circumstances, the cross becomes a real challenge to me. I just want you to, to know that in this week leading up to Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion, next Sunday, it might be helpful through the bulletin to read over the scriptures, particularly the Gospels, for the next six days. Give some time to reflecting on and thinking about some of those things that were in those two major items that I shared with you. And just remember that every time we gather here around the Lord's table, when we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, whether we participate in person or via Zoom, the same mystery of Christ's death and resurrection is celebrated, proclaimed, lifted up, and we are invited into it in person or you know, via Zoom. But we are invited into that mystery of his dying and rising that we came to share in first by our baptism. And that is renewed in us every time we participate in this saving action. His one saving sacrifice offered once for all upon the cross that is represented to us every time the Eucharist is celebrated, represented so that we can learn yet again and again and again what it means to follow the crucified and risen and how we can be ever grateful that God loved us enough to embrace us and welcome us into this saving embrace, this saving life, this saving love.